Hello, Why Religion friends. John Hilton here. Take a moment and think about your favorite holiday, not counting Christmas. Maybe it's Valentine's Day or Halloween or Thanksgiving. What makes that holiday special? While each of us might have different favorite holidays, my guess is there are key principles that we use to celebrate. We probably have decorations, special foods, and memorable traditions we connect with that holiday. Now think about how you celebrate Christmas. It's not just the day, it's the season, right? Christmas, of course, is a wonderful holiday. At the same time, President Gordon B. Hinckley said, there would be no Christmas if there had not been Easter. And yet, for many of us, our Easter celebrations are quite small compared to those of Christmas. I bring all of this up because this episode is being released on March 1st, 2024, which means that we have less than a month before Easter. So I've been thinking a lot about how I personally and in my own family can have increased focus on Jesus Christ, especially during the Easter season. As you recall, in the April 2023 General Conference, Elder Gary E. Stevenson said, I observe a growing effort among Latter-day Saints toward a more Christ-centered Easter. This includes a greater and more thoughtful recognition of Palm Sunday and Good Friday, as practiced by some of our Christian cousins. We might also adopt appropriate Christ-centered Easter traditions found in the cultures and practices of countries worldwide. Elder Stevenson then quoted New Testament scholar N.T. Wright as saying, we should be taking steps to celebrate Easter in creative new ways, in art, literature, children's games, poetry, music, dance, festivals, bells, special concerts. This is our greatest festival. Take Christmas away, and in biblical terms, you lose two chapters at the front of Matthew and Luke, nothing else. Take Easter away, and you don't have a New Testament. You don't have a Christianity. Each of us will receive our own inspiration about how we can best focus on Jesus Christ during the Easter season, in our personal lives, as well as in family and church settings. Here at the Why Religion Podcast, we're celebrating Easter by focusing our episodes this month on Jesus Christ and his resurrection. I was fascinated as I was preparing this article by the term, the sting of death is swallowed up mm. in Christ. Mm. And then I saw the Lord repeat over and over, I have drunk mm. out of the bitter cup that the Father has given me. And I, I thought, the I, swallowing, the swallowing up, so I wonder if that bitter cup was, at least in part, the sting of death. Mm. I have swallowed it up. I've, I've taken it. Mm. Uh, and we don't know what that was like for him, but we do know the effects on us, the lifting of that burden. In this episode of Why Religion, we'll explore the sting of death and how we can mourn with hope in Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Professor John Hilton, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Today we get to hear Janet Erickson interview her colleague, Hank Smith, about his recent publication, Morning with Hope. Dr. Smith will help us better understand the sorrows associated with death and how through Jesus Christ, we can truly have hope. I'm excited for this discussion. Let's dive in. 
Welcome to the Why Religion podcast. We're so delighted to have Hank Smith here with us to discuss first a talk given and then published in a book about the Savior um, called Learn of Me by John Hilton and Nick Frederick as the editors. The chapter, Hank, that you wrote is called Morning with Hope, and it's all about death and what it means to be a Latter-day Saint and have faith and hope in in the resurrection and how that shapes our experience of mourning. Do you mind sharing where the idea for writing about it came from, for talking about it? Sure, from? sure. Um, first, thanks for having me, Jenna. We're so glad to I'm have you. I'm excited to be here. I'm a big fan of why religion. The idea for the chapter um, came when I was invited by our department to speak for an Easter conference a couple of years ago, and I wanted to do something uh, that would give light to anyone who had suffered what I what the scriptures call the sting of death. My hope was in that devotional that we gave that Easter uh, was um, my hope was to help someone who was listening um, first of all feel the depth, kind of to walk with them in yeah. that depth of pain, mm. that, that darkness, mm. um, not to skip over it. Mm. Uh, so you'll notice the first half of the chapter is, uh, it's, I don't want to describe it as dark, but yeah, I, I want to go through the reality yes. of, of what this feels like, not skip over it, because yes. oftentimes we, I think we skip to the end. Yeah. Oh, you've lost someone. Well, here's yes. all the good. Yes. Here's all the good things you need to know. Uh, but instead, I, I wanted to just walk through the reality mm. of, of the loneliness and the, the, honestly, the emotional and even physical pain mm. uh, that people go through when they lose someone. You know, in our, in our culture, it's interesting. We we hide death. Someone passes away and. Whisked away. Whisked away. Yeah. And we don't see them again until yeah. the viewing. And then right. it's a, a quick viewing and then you know, buried yeah. uh, within within a week. I'm not sure if we if we're if we're just scared yes. of talking about it, yeah. facing it. Yeah. Looking at it. Yeah, even. like yeah. seeing it. Yeah. And then we all have to deal with this. Like this is a reality yes. that we don't want to think about. I think we avoid yes. thinking about it, especially our own. So the point of the article um, was to walk with someone through that reality and and to let anyone else feel that uh, that darkness, kind of let you in to that mm -hmm. if you hadn't experienced it before, yeah. and then to experience the light of the gospel. You really, you really can't know how wonderful the light of the gospel is until you sit in the in dark, the dark mm. for a while. Um, in fact, in the chapter, I, I bring up third Nephi where it's really powerful. The people sit in the, the dark, dark. Mm. for days mm. and it describes it as mourning and weeping and wailing, uh, which is very similar, I think, to what someone goes through uh, when a loved one passes away and then the light comes. It, Third Nephi 10 and 11, then the light comes and they've experienced the darkness. And now the light means so much more. I felt so much while I was reading the chapter that I was doing just what you described, walking through that reality, walking through the darkness and how beautiful to come upon the light, to have the light shine itself there in the dark place that you wouldn't know the light if you hadn't known the darkness. You also bring in church leaders' experiences of their loved ones passing away. President Nelson's description of trying to save his own wife, who passes away right before his eyes, who'd had a health, a bill of health given to her the week before, no expectation of this passing, and a renowned cardiologist, heart surgeon, cannot bring her back. But then you also quote President Hinckley, it is so powerful. He, des he describes when the last of life's breath is drawn, there is a finality comparable to no other finality. When a father and mother lay the remains of a beloved child in the cold of the grave, there is a grief almost inconsolable. 
When a husband buries the companion of his life, there is a loneliness that is poignant and unrelieved. When a wife closes the casket on the remains of her beloved husband, there are wounds that seem never to heal. When children are bereft of parents who loved and nurtured them, there is an abject destitution comparable to none other. Life is sacred and death is somber. Death is solemn and dark. It is awesome in its silence and certainty. That's a long quote, but it, it was powerful in walking into that through the words of President Hinckley. So do you mind just sharing your thoughts on Jacob's calling this the sting of death and referencing it as a monster right. in the Book of Mormon? I don't think I had quite understood mm. why Jacob calls it a, a monster. Mm -hmm. he's, he's really the only one in the Book of Mormon to use this, this term, this monster of death. Mm. I thought of my own children. Um, and how scared they are of their the monster yes. in Lurking. the closet, yes. right? the monster under the bed. Mm. And I thought, what is it that, that is scaring them? Uh, and perhaps it's their imagination of what this might be like and, the, and how unknown it is, the fear of the unknown. Mm. And how, uh, I think in their minds, how merciless mm. A monster might be. Yes, yes. It doesn't care how yes. much you don't want this yes. to happen. Wouldn't hear your cries. Right. Wouldn't hear your, yes. Just goes, just takes over, yeah. right? Takes you and, and hurts you. And I thought, now I can see, having experienced the death of loved ones, I can see why Jacob would call it mm. a monster. It's unstoppable. Uh, as much as you beg for death not to come, it comes. Mm. Uh, and for both rich and poor, male mm. and female. Mm. Um, I think one Greek poet said, we are we can secure ourselves against many, many things. Mm. We can build up walls of fortification. Yes. But when it comes to death, we are all a city without walls. Mm. Inevitability for all of us. Right. Here, here it comes and there is no stopping it. We are exposed and vulnerable mm. at all times. Mm. Right. Just living in a mortal world is risky. Mm. We take risks every day. I want to go into a little bit more about that pain and then come back to this okay. whole idea of the inevitability for all of us, because what does it mean to live life with that inevitability, right? To love in the face of that. You also reference the feeling that it is for people to to draw back memories. They can hear the laugh of the person who's passed away. You can search back in and and experience them and yet cannot experience them and it, and the pain of that i was thinking my mom once described how being married is like a weaving together of these fabrics and you know when you look at a fabric you can't tell where the weaving happens it's so close and when one when one passes away there's a tearing that takes part of you right. in a sense you woven into them and they into you with them and so, Hank, just thinking of your own experiences, you went through some tragic deaths, like one upon another. It was just after I finished this article, actually. So I feel like maybe the Lord was preparing, help you, yeah. Me, yeah, helping mm -hmm. me prepare for mm -hmm. something that was coming. Uh, after the pandemic hit in you know early 2020, uh, like everyone else, I went home and continued to work from home and. Uh, became a, a homeschool teacher, and, <laughs> right? Uh, but then right at the end of that year, 2020, my oldest brother, uh, he he texted me and said, hey, I, I think I have COVID. And we went back and forth and I said, well, you better, you know, you better go to the hospital. So he, he went over to the hospital and his oxygen levels were such that they immediately put him on oxygen and then on a ventilator. Mm. And it all happened so fast that, by the time I saw him, he was already oh. unconscious oh. on a ventilator. Oh. And uh, he was there for about two weeks and slowly. Uh, wow. The, the virus took him. And that was a shock, right? Mm. To have someone alive and well. Yeah. And then two weeks later, gone. gone. Mm. And then in January, that January, uh, one of my closest friends, um, he had a heart attack. Oh. Um, he's the bishop of his ward. Um, Another had, shocking. Had sacrament meeting oh. on Zoom. Um, 
uh, he he wasn't feeling well. Uh, thought perhaps he had COVID. Was going to go get tested the next day, uh, but ended up laying down on the couch uh, and passing away. Mm. Uh, and then just two months after that, um, March, um, my father, who had had cancer, uh, he had a stroke, um, and um, he also passed away. So. Mm. Right there in 90 mm. days, mm. it was just one hit after mm. another. And I, I remember thinking I was cursed. I yeah. was telling my friends, you better stay away from me. I, yeah. You know, the people around me who I love are, are all passing away. Mm. Um, and I, I definitely experienced um, what uh, I described, the darkness of that I described in the article. Now mm. I'm in the middle of it. Yeah. And the the grief was was overwhelming. It mm. it really uh, takes a toll on you, not only emotionally but physically and spiritually. Mm. You you feel um, you feel like you've been beaten up, uh, and you feel exhausted. Yeah. You and I in religious education we teach faith. Yeah, we teach faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now it was my opportunity mm. to live what I taught mm. students for. For years, mm. so I was grateful for the opportunity, though it was not pleasant. It mm. was a dark place to sit mm. uh, for uh, for weeks and months. Hank, thank you. Thanks for being open about all of those passings. I remember hearing you just briefly reference it, and I thought, "Wow, that's a lot for the soul to experience." So, thinking of that, I love how you describe this inevitability of death. And that it's universal, as you said, rich, poor, all of us. I think it's Buddhist writing, right? We are all perishing here. That's what we are doing. And none of us is going to escape it. You quote British novelist Howard Jacobson, who wrote, How do you go on knowing that you will never again, not ever, see the person you have loved? And I think to this point of they're living, they may be living now, but to know they will pass away. We will be separated. I was thinking last night with my husband, I just enjoy hearing him breathe. And right, just being beside me and hearing him breathe. And what that's like to in, in the same thought I was thinking someday, there will be a period of separation. I won't hear that or he won't hear me. So he says, how do you go on living? How do you survive a single hour, a single minute, a single second of that knowledge? How do you hold yourself together? So just your thoughts on what he's describing. How do we love here in the face of we're all going to die? We are all perishing here. What does that mean? We're not going to win. We're not going to get out of it. What does it mean about how we live now? In the article, I, I wrote a little bit about those who are trying to escape <laughs> yes. death. And there are multimillionaires who... who don't want to mm. go through this. Mm. I think there were two executives that I looked at out of California who had, between the two of them, had spent over a billion dollars uh. in anti-aging research. They <laughs> don't want, want to, to die. die. Oh. President Benson said, men and women will not desire the atonement mm. until they accept, understand and accept the doctrine of the fall. Wow. And I would even add to that, accept and understand and experience mm, mm. the doctrine of the fall. Mm. Uh, then we, we, once we understand the doctrine of the fall, we start looking for a way to escape. Mm. And I think that's what Jacob was after in Second mm. Nephi 9. The same thing Lehi, I think, was after in Second Nephi mm. 2. They were teaching the fall mm. to create mm. the need mm. for an atonement. Oftentimes, I think we try to teach the atonement without teaching mm. the fall. Mm. It's like mm, trying to save someone who doesn't know they're drowning, mm. right? Or trying to give light to someone who doesn't know they're, yeah. they're in the dark. Yeah. And that sets us right up for your beautiful description. You referenced it already. Here they are in Third Nephi in the midst of all of this darkness and paralleling his death and entombment in the dark of that Saturday, that waiting Saturday, and then the triumph of his appearance, light and hope emerging before their eyes and the overcoming of death. It's so powerful. Do you mind sharing? I, I love how you talked about what Joseph Smith declared, that the fundamental principles of our religion 
or the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died the fall, was buried, and rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven, and all other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to that reality. It's so beautiful. And what it means to be a Christian is this hope and this resurrection. Your thoughts, Hank, as you were writing this portion, getting through the dark, and what happens in the light? I, I really wanted to get to this part. I, <laughs> Faster. I, yeah, I, I, uh, I felt I felt no one's going to read this. Right? They're going to get. A couple, we spent so much time in the dark. Yeah, they're going to get a couple pages in and say, <laughs> "I can't, I can't handle this. Uh, this is really dark, difficult." Mm. As we really are sitting here in the dark, thinking, "What am I going to do?" That there's this glimmer mm. of mm. sunlight. The piercing of that darkness mm. that you can experience that those in third nephi experienced physically but you can experience that emotionally and spiritually mm. where you're sitting in that those moments of darkness and pain and then there's this across the horizon this shot of light mm. our colleague ryan sharp has said that this these the events of third nephi are maybe the greatest object lesson, mm. right? This, yes. <laughs> this object lesson yes. from the Lord, because as they're sitting in the dark, his one of his first statements is, I am Jesus Christ. Mm. I am the, the light. light. And mm. I can't imagine anything they wanted more mm. than that, mm. than that light. The Bible dictionary says that Christianity is founded mm. on this one miracle, mm. the resurrection of our Lord. And then it makes this statement. If that be admitted, meaning if you and I believe in the resurrection, every other miracle, the Bible dictionary says, ceases to be Im improbable. Mm. The greatest, most unimaginable thing happened. It Life is, restored. Right. It is beyond, uh. it is beyond human understanding. Mm. Science can't run a test for the resurrection, mm. right? It's... Uh, the data, if you were, if you were relying on data, the data does not support the idea that someone can die and three days later return to life. And not only that, we believe he returned to life, but he also will never die again. And not only that, he, he comes and goes from this, from earth, it yeah. seems at will. He, Without boundary. Right. So if, if he did mm. that, what else? is he going to do <laughs> <laughs> what else becomes possible right right yeah uh, um uh, our colleague mike mckay once he and i were talking and he said you don't look for jesus in the likely you find jesus in the unlikely mm. i'll i'll tell my students ironically you know one will come up and they'll be very confused and they'll say you know i i just don't think the flood of noah or yeah. jonah in the whale yeah. i just don't think that that is scientifically possible mm. And I'll say, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? <laughs> and they'll say, oh, yes, of course. Mm. I'll say, well, I think we stepped over the line of scientifically <laughs> possible. Uh, and I'm not saying that the flood was global or that, you know, the story right. of Jonah is literal. I'm, I'm not saying that. But it's interesting that we put bounds upon a man mm. who the doctrine of the resurrection declares has no bounds. Mm. The story of Joseph Smith receiving gold plates and writing yeah. a 500 page book of scripture in upstate new york in the 1820s mm -hmm. is unlikely mm. but it fits jesus's story mm. perfectly yeah yeah it's interesting i was just reading right now there's been talk of some people with notoriety converting to christianity from not from being agnostic or atheist and their reasoning will be they can see the benefits of community and a moral code to live by and even a christian code of forgiveness and all of that but the writer was saying we could tout the benefits of religion as a way of living and all of that but religion this religion is grounded in actual events an actual being who lived and died and was resurrected and that's what gives meaning to every aspect of the moral code. That's what makes possible the meaning of us living a life that would bring the fruits of the goodness of religion. So it's so beautiful that he intervened in every way, broke through to earth 
intervened and turned it upside down with actual events in his own miraculous glorified being. So you're testifying of that. Yeah. Okay. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe in the literal resurrection mm. of Jesus, that these things really did happen, mm. that he did return to life, and that he will return again, literally. Mm. G. Stanley Hall, an American psychologist, he wrote, the most essential claim of Christianity is to have removed the fear of death and made the king of terrors, mm. this darkness we've been talking about, into a good friend. Yeah. And boon companion, the savior, like you said, flipped the tables mm. where something was this awful monster yeah. is now something uh, that we, are, we, don't, we don't fear. In fact, we can, we can look forward mm. to. Mm. We can look forward to those reunions. Mm. At one man again, so beautiful, his atonement in every way, bringing at one man, overcoming death, being at one again. You talk with someone who has... Who has lost someone they they love and their heart is broken when this person is is gone i'll do this with my students have them envision in their minds that reunion mm. i said what what would you do if you know the the grandmother that you love mm. walked in the door it was really them mm. and they they they'll tell me i would I said, would you worry about class? Would you worry about homework? Would you worry about disturbing the room? No, I would climb over to get to, to, get to them. Mm. And the embrace would be overwhelming. The mm. joy of that would be overwhelming. And then to tell them, this will happen. Mm. This reunion mm. will happen. You'll hear their voice. You'll laugh with them again. You'll talk. You'll converse. That is the claim of Christianity. I think this, this psychologist, he's exactly right. He, he took the king of terrors. Jesus took the one thing that we avoid, we don't want to be part yes. of. And when we are a part of it, it just shatters us. Mm. And he made it beautiful. Oh, changing how we live every day is what you said. It changes how we live today. Absolutely. That changes the way you see people, mm. changes the way you see life around you. Mm. One thing it's changed for me personally is the springtime. Mm. Uh, Martin Luther taught that the Lord wants us to know that we'll live again. So he built it into nature. Nature, mm. And you, you look at a tree or a, a bush or a, a, a flower in the winter and it's wilted. And yes. It, it Gone looks, underground. Yeah, or, it, yes. it looks dead. Yes. And then within a week, all of a sudden... The weather changes, the sun comes out, and what was once dead is coming alive again. Mm. And so Martin Luther said, the Lord witnesses with every leaf in springtime. Mm. Of the reality. The reality mm. of, of living again. Mm. So as I walk around in the spring, I, I no longer just see the beauty of spring, but the oh. resurrection of, Witness. of all of us. Yeah. If you're interested in more high-quality gospel scholarship around Latter-day Saint scripture, history, or doctrine, check out BYU's Religious Study Center. The RSC recently released Jacob, Faith and Great Anxiety, edited by Avram R. Shannon and George A. Pierce. In this book, 12 Book of Mormon scholars analyze Jacob's writings and life. By closely examining Jacob's teachings, we find a prophet who cared for the welfare of his people, as well as an individual who was open about experiencing great anxiety, making him a scriptural figure that many of us can relate to. This volume gives us a greater appreciation for Jacob, who worked throughout his life with faith and great anxiety to bring others to Christ. Jacob, Faith and Great Anxiety is distributed by Deseret Book and available at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Hank Smith share thoughts on how the resurrection of Jesus Christ will allow us to be reunited with our loved ones. In part two, Hank shares insights as well as a tender story that illustrates the hope we can feel from the Savior's resurrection. 
The story you tell of the that President Monson told, I remember hearing this story in a couple oh, of goodness, different places. Yeah. But it is so powerful to think about in light of your title, Mourning with Hope, that it doesn't mean there isn't mourning, that there isn't loss. It's inevitable. It's it's going to and feel like a sting, as you describe so powerfully. And yet, what does it mean to have the hope and assurance of the resurrection mingled with that mourning? So she, of course, you tell the story of the woman that, with, that had children, I think four children, younger than seven years old, has been killed in World War II. She is trying to escape from Eastern Europe to get to a safer place. And in that cruel, bitter crossing, all four of the children die. And she is tempted to take her own life. What purpose does her life have? And he feels a strong prompting as a Latter-day Saint in that time period to pray. And then you include her words, Dear Heavenly Father, I do not know how I can go on. I have nothing left except my faith in thee. I feel amidst the desolation of my soul an overwhelming gratitude for the atoning sacrifice of thy son, Jesus Christ. I know that because he suffered and died, I shall live again with my family. That because he broke the chains of death, I shall see my children again and will have the joy of raising them. Though I do not at this moment wish to live, I will do so that we may be reunited as a family and return together to thee. Just such a beautiful testimony that takes that mourning and covers it in the hope and assurance of his real resurrection. I was fascinated as I was preparing this article by the term, the sting of death is swallowed up mm. in Christ. Mm. And then I saw the Lord repeat over and over, I have drunk mm. out of the bitter cup that the father has given me. And I, I thought, the swallowing, I, the swallowing up, so I wonder if that bitter cup was, at least in part, the sting of death. Mm. I have swallowed it up. I've, I've taken it. Mm. Uh, and we don't know what that was like for him, but we do know the effects on us, the lifting of that burden. Also, one thing that, I've, that I found while, while preparing this was this idea that the day you and your loved one were separated mm. because of Jesus Christ, that day is the furthest you will ever be from them apart. Mm. And mm. then each moment, each moment that you continue on brings you one more moment closer together. Wow. So each day that mm. you continue on, you're getting closer mm. and closer and closer to that individual. Mm. One of my friends, uh, S. Michael Wilcox, he said after his wife passed away, he feared the night. Mm. Uh, he the darkness of the, the darkness night. Of the night. He said yeah. I could be distracted during the day, and mm. I could, I could be talking with people and um, be working and writing and and teaching. But then at night, mm. he said, watching that sun go down, it just the pain returns. He said, until I realized that each one of those sunsets meant I was, mm. I was one step closer mm. to her, mm. to our reunion. Mm. And then he said, I started looking forward to the night. Wow. Because I realized another step has, has gone. So I, I find that very mitigating. Yes. Um, that the furthest you will ever be is that moment. Yes. And time will pass. Yes. And you will be closer and closer together and mm. eventually you will return and be reun reunited like you said that that weaving will that tearing will will be mended mm. i wonder janet if that in those days when you're reunited with your loved one if it will feel as if it, it the was, separation didn't even happen it was maybe. so fast yeah that's right? so interesting it was so yeah. fast it feels like it was a blink of an eye Perhaps that's why the Lord tells Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, thine affliction shall be but a small moment. Mm. That when, when you're out of this and mm. when I've reunited you with your loved one, you'll, you'll look and wonder, 
why why was that so upsetting? Yes, yes. Um, and I, I hope it's that way. Yes. Right? I hope it's that way. It seems that that promise of being swallowed up, right? The death is the sting is swallowed up. Is that all-consuming covering of love and joy in the overcoming of the death? Hank, it was so touching to read about your in-laws, Rod and Marlene Savage, and this love story. And I think something about the story, I would love to have you talk about it, but something about the story is so beautiful in this tour that new life takes of their home and then taking her that last time on a tour of their home before she would be separated from the home. But just how, how it brought in the recognition of the reality of death and also the assurance of life in the very moment, a rejoicing in it, in the time we had together here on earth. Just would love to hear your thoughts. My in-laws, Rod and, and Marlene Savage, met in Richfield, Utah as elementary school students, went on a couple of dates in high school and ended up marrying and, uh, and moving down to St. George, which is where I met them. Rod is this gregarious, fun <laughs> person, Marlene, more stoic, uh, but also fun um, in her own in her own way. Rod cares more about having fun, and and Marlene cares more about <laughs> you know making make, sure things are done. <laughs> things are, are done and put in order. They the wonderful complementary mm. relationship. When they brought their first baby home, baby Justin, uh, just on a whim, Rod decided oh, I better take him on a tour of the house, right? The apartment actually at the time. Um, and here they are in their two bedroom apartment and he's taking this baby on a, mm. a tour of this is the faucet and this is the picture. <laughs> Welcome to earth, yep. to this home. This is the fridge. <laughs> and, uh, and Marlene said this tour took, you know, over an hour for him to <laughs> describe every everything. item in the house, right? <laughs> Showing this two day old baby, this, mm. this house. And uh, just like it happens in, in other people's homes, silly things become traditions. So two years later, when baby Amy came, there's little Justin, two years old, following dad around as he gives a tour to the new baby, mm -hmm. baby Amy. And then as each child came, the whole family would go on the tour, go on the, the tour mm -hmm. showing the baby the house. And uh, with their sixth child, uh, that was the end of the tour for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they didn't have any more children. But then a decade later, a little over a decade later, they had a grandchild <laughs> and the tour resumed, right? Well, the rejoicing of here's uh, their first grandbaby. And uh, when I, I married their daughter, Sarah, everybody goes on the tour. So when a new grandbaby comes home, everybody uh, comes to grandpa's wow. house, he gathers everybody. We're all going on the tour. I remember the first time I said to my wife, what are we doing? <laughs> And she said, this is what we do in our family. Mm -hmm. Eventually, people trickle off from the tour and return to what they were doing. But there's grandma and grandpa mm -hmm. taking this new grandbaby on a tour of the house. And he would use it actually as a teaching tool after a while because he'd come up to me and he'd show me my nephew and say, this is your Uncle Hank. Mm -hmm. He is going to take such good care of you. Mm -hmm. He's going to help be one of these people that watch over you. Wow. And I still feel that yeah. obligation. Oh, were right. those nephews and nieces? Yeah, too? I still, you know, mm. that, that boy is 25 and I still text him and say, how you doing? How are you mm. holding up? And I think he's, why is Hank so interested in me? And I think, well. <laughs> I was initiated yeah, into that I role. I was in the door. <laughs> I, I have to do it. So um, this tradition continued. Even my twin boys went on a, a double tour. I remember seeing Rod hold both of them as they mm. walked him through the house. Uh, and then in uh, around 2013, uh, Marlene uh, told the family that she had liver cancer uh, and she wouldn't live long. Uh, she was just 65, which I remember thinking was old at one point. Yeah, right? and now 65 it's... 65 oh. and there's way too young, yes. way too young. Uh, and 10 months later, after that announcement, she was on hospice care and, mm. uh, and just days away from passing away. And uh, one of the hospice nurses, uh, the night uh, she passed away, came to Rod and said, um, judging by her vital signs, I think it's going to be soon, uh, within the next few hours. So let's get her out of her wheelchair and lay her in bed. And he said, okay. Um, but as he went over to, to get her out of her wheelchair, he had a spark <laughs> of inspiration and he went to the hospice nurse and he said, can we 
can I do something first? And of course the hospice nurse said, yes, yeah, what, what do you need? And he gathered his children around those, um, they were all there. And he said, let's take mom oh. on a tour. Mm. And he said, we, we went first to the living room and he knelt down in front of her and said, 47 oh. years of family home evening. How did you put up with all of us, <laughs> right? And then he took her to the, the television room, the family room and said, how many shows have we watched together? How many John Wayne movies have you put up with? Um, and then uh, to the kitchen and knelt down in front of her and said, 47 years mm. of us making meals. Mm. He said, you're, you're the greatest cook that's ever lived. And my wife said she saw her mom, you know, visibly like smirk, <laughs> you liar. Uh, and, um, and the kids kind of stepped back as, mm. as he wheeled his, his wife around the house and, and wept and, uh, and then this, you know, this gentle giant picked up his, his bride and, uh, laid her in her bed. And then he knelt there by her for about six hours and just held her hand as she, as she slowly, um, and gently and peacefully passed away. And I remember asking him, you know, a month or two later, I said, that was a, that was a very touching thing that happened. And he said, you know, I didn't want her last day to be sad. Oh. I wanted to rejoice in the life, mm. her life she had lived mm. and the children she had raised and mm. the grandchildren she adored. Mm. And he said, I didn't want her to be scared. I wanted her to be excited mm. about the reunion she was just about to experience. And he had said to her something like, give my mom a hug for me. Oh. Right. Tell her how much I love her and tell her how much I miss her. Uh, to me, that's the idea of mourning with so, hope. So beautifully captured. Mourning with hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I, he is mourning right, in, yes. this, in this experience. Yes. It's, this wasn't easy. This wasn't, um, this wasn't with a light heart. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a deep, um, it was a deep, very sensitive, very poignant experience. Yet, um, yet it was, it was hopeful. It was, um, it was a moment of, of testimony. He didn't mm. say, he didn't say he, he believed. He, he showed. Yes. He believed. Um, my wife watching this, um, she said uh, it was a witness to her of the reality of, of the resurrection. Mm. Uh, it's not something we are even wishing for. It's something we're planning on. Mm. So beautiful. I, as I read it, I was thinking of a beautiful phrase from someone I love, knowing that loss is inevitable. How do we live in a way that redeems what is lost? And, and just so beautiful to think of all the memories of love. And it was, it was actually her passing that gave it such significance. What she had offered and given and embodied in that home, just woven into the fabric of that home, all the memories, all the love, all the goodness. And somehow it just redeems what is lost in the way that we live. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who makes, who's the author of all that redemption that changes how we love today because of the inevitable loss and it's being overcome by him. If you're interested in reading Morning with Hope, we've provided a link to it in the show notes and on our website, whyreligion.byu.edu. I've also linked to other publications by Dr. Smith, as well as his fabulous podcast, Follow Him. But for now, it's time for our last segment, part three, where we get a little more personal. Here, Hank tells us about his journey to BYU and shares his feelings about the restoration of the gospel and the atonement of Jesus Christ. We're just going to transition into just hearing a little bit about you. <laughs> and I know we've shared some of that thing, some of that along the way, but, but just a little bit about your education background. 
Where did you get your PhD? What brought you here to religious education? One of the things that we all treasure about you is that you are part of the lives of our children and our own lives because of your magnificent gift with teaching truth. And we felt it today, but but I think of my own children and how much they admire you because of your ability to teach and connect with them. And all of that is part of your story. What landed you here in religious education and your educational journey and CES journey? My students will come up to me and they'll say, how did you decide, <laughs> right, on your, that you wanted to be a religious educator, you wanted to get into this. And I, I'll often say, I, I haven't yet decided, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> did I decide that? Yeah, I don't remember deciding that. I remember, uh, I remember trying to follow the opportunities mm. that came and follow mm. those feelings of this feels, this feels good. This feels like a mm. wonderful opportunity, but I don't remember ever a moment where the Lord told me this is what I had to do. Yes. This is what I was meant to do. Um, but I did find uh, something that I loved in teaching. And uh, I had a, a an advisor in college who said, do what you love, mm. do what you love. Because um, you're gonna spend you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing it. Mm. So do something you love. Uh, and I knew I loved to teach. I started with uh, being an EFY counselor uh, it's now FSY, but uh, this was back in the 1900s. So I was an <laughs> EFY counselor, uh, and that moved into teaching seminary um, uh, down in southern Utah. And uh, from there, uh, I became a full-time seminary teacher, taught in Park City High School, uh, taught it, uh, out in West Jordan at Copper Hills High School, taught uh, here in Utah County at Springville High School. Uh, and then they had the opportunity while I was getting my doctorate degree here at BYU in educational leadership uh, to teach some religion classes while I was here and ended up just mm. loving, loving my time uh, with these, with these college students. Well, my time ended, I finished my doctorate degree and went back to teaching seminary and that was my plan. Uh, but um, interestingly, a, uh, a teacher here, Jeff Marsh, great teacher. Yes. Um, just in the middle of a semester break, a Christmas break, was called by the church and brought up to Salt Lake to do some mm. assignments. And um, the department chair at the time was uh, Camille Olson. Uh, and she called uh, seminaries and institutes and said, um, I need Hank back here. Mm. She's, I, re I really need to credit Camille for yes. my employment here mm. because she she made it happen. Um, and so I got a call um, mm. just before Christmas um, a couple of uh, years ago, I guess it's been longer now. Uh, and they said, uh, uh, Camille uh, has needs you to return to BYU. Wow. And so I, I came back and all the students were expecting Jeff Marsh, this incredible teacher. Yes. And that's who they'd signed up yes. for, right? They'd signed up for Jeff Marsh's yes. class. And now that I've been here a while, I thought, oh man, what a what a terrible thing to do to them. Uh, and uh, I picked up where where Jeff had left off and wow. had a wonderful experience. And then his spot actually became open, open mm. and I was encouraged to apply. And so I, I got that spot. I miss my seminary and institute days, but I love my time here. In oh religious education at BYU. It is, and you know this, it is it, for those of us who love to teach, uh, love the gospel and love young people, there is no better mm. employment. And you are such a remarkable gift well, to kind. BYU. What classes or subjects do you teach? So I teach in the ancient scripture department. Um, so I spend a lot of time teaching the New Testament and the Book of Mormon. So I teach a class called Christ and His Everlasting Gospel that walks through the Abrahamic Covenant and into the Gospels and then uh, continuing on to the Restoration. And my hope is that a student can walk away from my class ready for an, another class called Foundations of the Restoration. Mm -hmm. So that would be a wonderful bridge. Yes, right, to, connecting them to, across to, time. Yeah, across time. The we'll covenant. start with We'll start with Adam and Eve and mm. to Abraham all the way up to... The Reformation, that's where I usually finish my classes, the mm. Reformation. And then a teacher in, in your department uh, can take them and walk them through the Restoration. Mm. Uh, so, um, and then I have the incredible opportunity to teach 
Book of Mormon classes. Mm. And the more I teach this book, the more I come to love it. There's times where I think I cannot be more impressed with the Book of Mormon. Mm. Like I have, I there's have no way I can yeah, be more th- impressed. Yeah. This, this book cannot shock me mm. anymore. And mm. then it happens again. Wow. Uh, where one of our colleagues will will point out something to me that I've never mm. seen before, and this book is becoming more and more magnificent mm. uh, over the decades of of teaching it. Mm. Um, Janet, you and I both know that uh, someone who works full time studies these scriptures for our employment and what a blessing that is yes um would figure out if these things are not true not true <laughs> right yeah um we this is where we spend our our life and our time mm-hmm. uh and yet my decades of wow i'm getting older my decades mm-hmm. of study uh, have only increased my testimony mm-hmm. uh, in the resurrection and the restoration mm-hmm. oh that hank then one last question. Mm-hmm. How, why do you love or believe in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? Mm-hmm. What a wonderful question. And I don't know if there are words. Mm-hmm. When someone asks me, what's, how do I feel about those two subjects, the resurrection of Jesus and the restoration of the gospel, you start to think, how can I put it into words? Mm-hmm. I these are powerful feelings mm. uh, that rise up in you, and then you have to clothe them in, <laughs> in language. And you think, I don't have the words uh, to describe it. Um, I told my students the other day, I said, I can't describe um, the church and our doctrine and our belief in the Lord in English, in words. I said, like um, we were looking at the book of Revelation, and I said, that's why symbols are so powerful because they can convey more than words. I said, if I were to describe the Lord, I don't think I could use the word amazing mm. or magnificent mm. because you might say to me, oh, I received an amazing text or look at this magnificent picture. And that does not cover my feelings about the Lord. Uh, and so I came up with an analogy that that I liked. I said, the Lord is is every every glorious view i've ever had of every national park mm. of every mm. sunrise or sunset or any every every man-made beautiful mm. piece of art he's all of that combined in a single moment mm. wow and that I, in fact some of the students went yeah wow. right like indescribable yeah, in words yeah because we there's not a there's not an adjective yes that would describe how i feel about the resurrection and the restoration mm. um, but for me that kind of captured right that those breathtaking moments you have in life and what if you got to experience all of those in a single moment mm. that would be mm. close to how i feel about the resurrection and the restoration of the gospel Thanks for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is John Hilton, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Jenna Erickson, Casey Griffiths, Jared Halverson, Travis Searle, Ryan Sharp, Hank Smith, and Brad Wilcox. Promotional materials, were created and distributed by Leanne Copas and Katie King. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU students Alec Galloway and Ethan Arkell. Original music and scoring for the Why Religion podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion and leave us a rating. This really helps others discover the podcast. And join us next time as we continue to bring the Everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by BYU religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith in Jesus Christ.